to a meeting of the editorial board of the St. Augustine Record with candidate for the office of St. Augustine City Commission seat 2. We're joined by Susan Rathbone. Representing the record is publisher Tony Bernados, executive editor Craig Richardson, city government reporter Sheldon Gardner, and opinion page editor Jim Sutton. This discussion is taking place on the morning of October 28, 2016. So, thank you so much for joining thank us today. Thank you. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to meet with us. Um, what we'd like to do first is just give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and then tell us why you're running for this office, okay. this position. Um, I'm Susan Rathbone. I moved here about 34 years ago and um, have lived here on and off since then. So I have a real um, history with the city and love the city. To me, this was the most romantic place on earth when I was a little girl. And um, about three years ago, I got involved with my neighborhood association. And I didn't like what I saw. I felt like for a neighborhood association to be very political, it really opened my eyes to some of the other things going on. Um, in the city because I think that's a little microcosm of what's going on in the city and now I see that what's happening in the city is happening in a larger scale nationally and I don't like it. Um, I became very involved going to city meetings, planning and zoning meetings, working with city staff, contacting the commissioners. Um, many times tried to contact commissioners and my phone calls went unanswered. So to me that was very unsatisfactory. Um, so I decided to do something about it. Um, currently I have taken a hiatus from my work, which is school administrator, to take care of my father who is now unfortunately <coughs> terminally ill. So um, I have the time and the energy to commit to this job. Thank you. Sure. All right. Oh, sorry. Let's see. When your neighborhood association is North Davis. Short, Sands, that yes. Was that, that was not, were y'all spared most of that, the north? Uh, I that was the worst I'm trying to, well I'm no it's went. interesting because people are saying that the south side of Davis Shores took the biggest hit mm -hmm. but really there are numerous houses just completely demolished in my neighborhood as well so I think it's all of Davis Shores was hit hard all of the county. yeah the city what what, what? Where, what were you doing as a school administrator? Where was that? I was a school administrator beginning in San Diego, um, mm -hmm. Encinitas, California, then was hired by Title I and moved out to Charlotte, North Carolina, worked um, on a turnaround team, a state turnaround team to turn around failing schools. And that's what I did. Um, and then that particular school district split into several smaller school districts and I was part of uh, the district office at that point and oversaw 35 schools um, mostly compiling their data their test scores looking at trends um, giving them advice as far as education and really the whole goal is to make failing schools successful so my question why didn't you run for school board you say in your, in your, that, you, that you have owned or own I have owned. Businesses? I have. Is I've owned, your? no, I've owned a Huntington Learning Center, um, and I've also owned a Sylvan Learning Center. And when I was married, we had a pool fiberglass and business, and I did all of the bookkeeping um, and marketing for that business. Okay. All of this has not been here. What, how long have you been living back? I've Obviously, been back here. Been completely this is my eighth year okay and do you do you work do you have a do you think here I, I don't know yes do I was answer. when I um, decided to take care of my dad full-time I stepped down from school administration and began teaching again at Ponte Vedra Palm okay. Valley okay. which is the school where I attended um, middle school and um, then taking care of my dad, just I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't be at school and get mm -hmm. a phone call to come home, and it was too difficult. Okay. okay. 
just trying to get it. Yes. Straight. Um, you also say that, that I believe that you feel like the balance between businesses and residences is off or way off? Or I think, I think it's off. way off. Okay. Um, and I'll tell you my perspective on that. 34 years ago, I was part of the management team. Is that me? At the Columbia restaurant? I'm so sorry. I thought I turned it off. Okay. Um, at the Columbia restaurant. And during that time, this was prior to the bed tax, anything being done, we were begging for some sort of advertisement to bring people to this town. I mean, this town had no, almost no tourism at all back then. And I tell the story of when I would carry the bank deposits in my high heels walking down St. George Street to Barnett Bank because there was no one there. There was no safety risk. Um, and that was bad. But now we've gone to this other extreme where we're putting so much emphasis on tourism. And residents, we're suffering from red water that we can't drink. We have flooding in our yards. We have potholes. We need better street lights, sidewalks. Those are the things that residents need. And um, looking at the past eight years and where the city has put their money, they have not put their money where it needs to be, in my opinion. Okay, specifically, where's the, where's the city putting its money for the businesses above, above the residents? Right. Well, I would say right off the bat, the 450th. That was a lot of money, and I know my opponent brings up that she spent four years during a recession. It was during those four years that the money was put towards the 450th. So we found the money somewhere. Um, Currently, there are things in the budget like we got $400,000 to um, extend the seawall to the city marina. That's a lot of money. That's not coming out of our pockets. That's a wonderful thing. But then we're adding money from the city to that to create a little snack bar kiosk. Why are we doing that? We've got umpteen restaurants in the city for people to eat at. Why as a city are we taking money away from paving roads to build a snack bar kiosk? That doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Are there any other specific examples that, that, you, that you think we're overspending? On, oh. Is it businesses or tourism that you think? We're spending I think too it's much both. Money? Tourism drives businesses. Okay. And, um, Aside from just the money, we've made changes. For example, parking is an issue. We used to be able to drive down St. George Street, and I'm all in favor that we paved it, but when we paved it, we were still able to access parking, so we could still go to the businesses on St. George Street. We could park behind the tavern, we could go, you know, I bought everything, I didn't have a car. I bought everything from St. George Street, all my clothing, my clothing, my office goods, sundries, everything I needed. Now parking has become so difficult and inaccessible and expensive that we've seen the businesses on St. George Street change with the market. They've become nothing but tourist driven. It's not, it's not authentic. It's not a real main street. Is there a way to dial that back? I mean, yes. How do you unwind the clock? I think at this point, we have to just reverse it. If I believe all of this started because parking was inaccessible and being able to get there was inaccessible. So we need to make it where residents can access those shops. When residents access the shops, then the market changes because the residents have needs and would drive the market for that. So what does the parking look like? Is it, is it another garage? Is it surface lots? You know, one of, one of my ideas is working with the current businesses to access the parking they already have, like Flagler, that no one's there three months of the year, and the weekends are not there, and the evenings are not there. That could be one potential way. I don't think, and this is from me personally, I don't think parking at the parking garage is going to make me bring my business back to the city center. And I'll tell you why. Uh, there is a spice shop right on Kuna Street. 
and I needed a spice that no one else had. I drove around, drove around, drove around looking for parking, couldn't find a parking spot. Then I had to pay $12 to park in the garage, had to fight through all the pedestrian traffic to go get my $3 spice that's now cost me 15 and an hour and a half. So I don't think that's the place that's gonna attract the residents. And I don't entirely know what it is. I think it's, it's multiple ways. It has to be more pedestrian friendly, more bicycle friendly. We, there has to be a whole um, multimodal way to do that. People have talked about changing the parking fee structure in the garage. Do you support that? Yes. Um, first of all, I don't think it should be a flat fee. Just the example of me with my spice. I'm not going to spend $15 on a spice. I'd rather drive to Jacksonville to get my spice. Um, I think for residents, there needs to be a different fee than there is for other people, and they can show their driver's license or whatever it is. And also, they need to sell the parking um, passes in more places. It needs to be easily accessible. Um, they should sell them right there on the spot at the parking garage. Um, so, yeah. But there is a three, the residents do have a $3 fee at the parking garage. It's not 12, it's three for any resident. It wasn't when I parked there, so. You need to keep your park yeah. now card. Because <laughs> it's, it's, you have that $3. No, that's exactly mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. Where do you buy the park now card? In one right. or two locations. Yeah. You can't buy it at the parking garage when you're mm -hmm. going there to park. So that needs to be accessible. So would I leave the parking garage now to drive to the utility building to buy my Park Now card and then go back? That, that's not convenient. This is a good place to jump into mobility and the study that's going on and, and the solutions that are being, well, I guess considered or, or looked for. What, how, how do you, what do you think of that process? The one to hire this, the, uh, the group to come in and perform the study mm -hmm. and to wh what results would you expect as, a, as an observer? Well, as an observer, um, I think I'm the one that came out and said there are 35 studies that have been done in the past 10 years that I actually have on my bookshelf and have actually read. Um, that tells me that we tend to like studies like any academic might, but we don't move past that. Um, in the mobility study that was done, not a single suggestion was implemented. And we're talking putting up a stop sign or a crosswalk. These are not big ticket items. Nothing was done. In the current mobility study? In the mobility study that was done about two, three okay. years ago. So it's for me and the way I tend to work, I would have taken all of those studies, compiled them with all of their suggestions, because some of them are very good studies. Um, I would have started with that and looked realistically at what things had already been suggested. We've already had public input on most of those. I would have started with that. I feel that to do this whole public outreach that we've just done was a waste of money because quite frankly, we've already identified the problems. There's not a single problem that came out of that that we didn't already know about. Did you talk about the Mobility Institute? Was it called? Is that the yes, yes, by the TPO. Do you, do you feel like this study has been politicized as well? Absolutely, yes. I think just about everything is politicized. Um, but I do think just as someone who tends to like to get to the heart of the matter, what we've done thus far, I think, was a waste. Now, that's not to say what's coming is going to be a waste. Hopefully now we'll move beyond this and really have some realistic um, things that we can put in place. So what would be the first thing that you do? What would be the first thing I do? Um, I think they've they've already started, I would calibrate the lighting, I would make the bridge of lions when there's a backup of traffic, I would have it where we clear the traffic that's been waiting, 
almost like having a police officer in the middle of the road um, clearing, you know, after church, they clear out the parking lot. I think we could do something as simple as that. Um, you know, they are already thinking of trying some one-way roads. Personally, I don't know how that's going to help because that doesn't change the volume of the cars in the historic area. I think we need to do something, I think, almost like Williamsburg. You don't drive around through Williamsburg. We need to have some areas that are just pedestrian friendly and keep some of the cars outside of the city. Um, looking at satellite parking, carpool parking for people who work downtown. Are there any certain places you think should be pedestrian only? You know, well, St. George Street is. I think you could have Avalay, could be pedestrian only. Um, you know, there's some other roads that they are looking at. Um, but again, I can't say one street because I don't know what the other streets are going to do. But I think it's something we have to look at. Um, I think you mentioned that you, you think that code enforcement in the city is unfair or inconsistent. Absolutely. Okay. Can you give me an example of that? Oh, sure. Um, if you just look at Anastasia Boulevard, we've had certain codes in place right or wrong whether you agree with them or not but they have been in place yet one building is allowed to put up a sign that um, does not meet code where they're very harsh on another business who's trying to erect a sign and forcing them to meet code it's you look at a new business's bail fire tried to open they hung a little um, banner over where their signage was. Code enforcement was there saying he was going to charge them $400 a day as long as that sign was up. Yet then you have Rochelle's who just put up a new sign. Where was code enforcement there? That sign also doesn't meet the code. Um, it, just, it just seems a little good old boyish to me. I think we need more people enforcing codes, but I also think we have a lot of codes without teeth that are unenforceable that need to be done away with or rewritten to truly uh, represent what we want. Are there any of those that stick out in your mind? Oh, yeah. Um, currently, we have a code for um, parking lots in residential areas. Well. CL1 is the buffer between residential and commercial, but those particular codes for RS1 and 2 parking lots aren't extended to CL1, yet CL1 is in essentially a residential area. And I'm talking about uh, different types of lighting, um, water abatement, a wall around the parking so when people leave the business, their bright lights aren't shining in someone's bedroom. Uh, that would be one code that I would do okay. right off the bat. Um, I, I believe you also think there's some sort of lack of transparency in city government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think there's a lack of transparency. And I'll tell you, I came to that from being someone who would go to the city to get things done for my neighborhood. And I know the meetings that I would have with different people and the conversations that would be had that in this case would help me get what I wanted done done. But I know none of that was in the sunshine. None of it. Um, so Conversations you had with city people? Mm -hmm. Were they Breakfasts, lunches. I think right now... Are you meeting with two or more city officials at the same time? No. But I can tell you, when you meet with the city manager, mm -hmm. and he then has the freedom to meet with every single commissioner one-on-one, -on -one, conversations and information is getting passed. They may not call each other directly, mm -hmm. but there is a line of communication. And I think we see that at city commission meetings now. 
You can't have four people all like-minded without any conversation at the table. So conversation had to have happened somewhere at some point in time. I'm sorry, you think it's inappropriate for the city manager to meet with the commissioners individually? And no, that's not what I'm saying. But I am saying there's sunshine law for a reason. And I think that we're still having some communications that we're getting around the sunshine mm -hmm. law with that. Of course, the city manager has to meet with them. Um, but there are conversations that are happening that really should be happening out in the open. You mean like passing one message, uh, information from one commissioner to right. the other? Right. I met with Susan the other day. This is what she thinks about that. What do you think about that? So that's that have information. You, have you heard that's happening? Or, or, I mean, have you heard I know what's from, happening. From John Reagan? How do you know it's happening? Because I know when I have fought for things that have gotten done, that he has said he would talk to different people about it. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm. Yeah, I mean, could I prove it? No, I would have to be there in the room when it happens. But as far as transparency, I feel there is a lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. Currently, you can go on the website to access the financials. You would have to have a PhD in computer science to actually get to the information that you're looking for. So not only should it be there, it needs to be ease of access. And it needs to be in a way that normal people can understand it. Um, for a commissioner to say, uh, we must not understand the budget, well, why is that? What form is the budget coming out in that we can't understand it? I'm not sure. I've looked at that budget, and I can see all of it online, but I think Tony would have all of it. I don't, I don't well, I spent a week just, going just, through just it so line by line, mm -hmm. so and I can balance my checkbook, so I think I can understand money in, money out. Mm -hmm. And and you're not, you don't think you can clean that from the website, or it's just too difficult to do. It's or? it's very arduous to do, um, very arduous, and I tend to spend a lot of time at the computer. I don't think you know. The average person can dedicate that much time to getting information that should be easier to you get. you think that's intentional? No, not at all. I just think it's part of our learning curve and growing. Um, I think it's a step now that we have it there, and now we just need to make it more user-friendly. No, I don't think that's intentional. Okay. Yes, sir. What? Why do you think there's a change needed for this seat? Well, quite frankly, I'm, I'm pro term limits generally. I would not be voting for someone who's already had eight years in office. Um, and that's just me. We don't have term limits, so my opponent could run. I've also seen over the past two years some real ugliness real ugliness it's specifically it's, from commissioner freeman or? from yeah commissioner freeman commissioner neville i think there needs to be across the board change but you can't do that um, right now the only seats that are up are three um, i think that there is a mindset right now that they need to be a team and be like-minded and and i disagree with that they're not supposed to think as a team. They're supposed to be able to, bait, to debate the issues, and they need to have their ear to the citizens to make the right decision for the citizens. Mm -hmm. And what I see right now, just like with the budget they just approved, um, and I'll, I'll tell you real basically, in the budget for paving the roads, they have 77 miles of road. And they are going to repay 5% 5 per, 5 or 7 miles. 5% of 77 miles is not, or is not 7 miles. So right off the bat, there's an error in the budget. But they were so intent on not allowing 
Nancy Shaver to who I'm sure they were disgruntled. She went to the public. She did all this stuff, which so they were so intent not to let Nancy Shaver win that they really didn't even look at that because had they looked at that, they would have seen that's an error. It really should be 7% or five miles, which is accurate. Um, so, you know, I think what I've seen over the past two years is if she starts to speak, they shut her down. You're talking about Nancy? Yes. Um, and that's wrong. Whether you voted for her or not, she has a position and she does speak for people and they deserve to be heard. All, all four of the other commissioners? Or just... Uh, no, from what I've seen, it, they're a block. That's that's what I've seen. They seem to be a block. Um, they, you know, so yeah, I think their needs change. I think it does us a disservice. As my neighborhood president, if I have an issue now, who do I go to? I should be able to talk to any one of them for representation. But now I can't. If I go to Nancy Shaver, they don't like her, so what I need done is going to be squashed. If I go to this person, that person doesn't like them. It's, it's ugly. Hmm. How often do you attend meetings? Um, I was going for about a year and a half to every single meeting. Okay. Um, the past few months, I have tend to watch them on TV. Okay. Um, unless it's important and I have a reason to go and speak, and then I'll be there. Okay. All right, so you've, you've established that there's a block. Right. Let's say you are elected into this position and three remain. Mm -hmm. How are you going to handle that? Well, you know, that's, that's interesting. Um, first of all, I'm professional mm -hmm. and I'm there to do a job. And my job is to represent the constituents. They are also there to do a job. So if I toe the line, act professional, do my job, I would hope they would do the same thing. Um, when I worked in Title I schools, most people in my position would be sent to one school at a time, one school to focus on for a year. I was sent into four, four of the lowest performing schools at a time. Now, you can't come in as an outsider into a school that's very close-knit, Every teacher feels they're doing the greatest job. I'm now an outsider coming in, and they think I'm going to tell them what to do or how to do it or beat them on the head because they failed. Well, I can't do that because then I couldn't get them to rise to the level for the kids. So I'm personally able to put feelings aside and get the job done and mend fences and build bridges. And I would hope they can, too. Do you feel like you, you mentioned that Mayor Shaver has been a bit of an outsider amongst them? Is that fair to say? Absolutely. Okay. So do you, do you think she's done a good job? Because she's in a similar situation. She would right. Walk into, right. I think she's done. I think she could have done a lot better job. And I think there were a lot of things that people wanted that she wanted to change and she was not able to. She was blocked. And that hurts our city. Um, and they, she was blocked because it was coming from her. Um, I, I don't think I speak out of turn when we have one commissioner using an alias to go on social media to write scathing things about the mayor. That's, that's not good. Um, you know, and there are things that each of them have done. Ms. Freeman standing up and cutting the meeting short. Uh, anytime you watch a meeting and if she talks, they talk over her, they interrupt her, they don't want to hear it. That's hurting us. Whether you like her or not, whether she won by 500 votes or one vote, she did win. So you said that you were disappointed to find politics in, in the neighborhood association. Mm -hmm. you're, you're jumping from the frying pan into the fire with this. Obviously, there's 
all sorts of well, I think. Why, why put yourself through that, I guess? It's well, I, I fought for a number of things in my neighborhood. Um, for example, the Castle property was going to be an event venue. Um, and from my research, I discovered when people's homes, their residences, were changed by the city to commercial without their knowing it. I then. Um, formed an action committee, and we're the ones that pushed the city to revamp that code, to define what an event venue is and to place it in the code. So I'm not unfamiliar with working with the city already. Um, it's just, you know, the, I think most people that want to help, you start with your neighborhood, the next step is to make it a little larger, which is the city, and then if that's palatable or you're doing a good job, you might look further. I, I won't, but some might. I think that kind of personality is the personality that does that. You mentioned the castle, and it seems like you've been involved in at least a couple of zoning issues. Yes. Do you bring a certain view about rezonings in the city, or would you bring a certain view about that to the commission, or how would you deal with, with zoning issues or rezoning? Well, I think, um, first of all, I think our zoning code does need to be revamped. I think it's impossible to do it all at once, but I think there are areas that are being hit hard, like HP1. So uh, HP1, CL1, I think the codes for those two zoning definitions need to be looked at. I was just in a mediation with Sanchez House, uh, which is on Bridge Street, 7 Bridge Street, and we had no foot to stand on as a city, none. Had he decided to litigate, we the city would have lost. And that is because the way our zoning code is written, and it hasn't been revamped. So, you know, yes, ultimately, let's redo the whole zoning code, but start small. You can do baby steps and do the most impacted areas first. Um, CL1 I spoke about earlier with the parking lot. CL1 is, is right in between a business and a residence. So we need to look at that and protect the resident side. Is that your main focus then, just protecting the residential areas? No, I think, um, you know, some of what I want to do is protect the businesses, new businesses in particular. Very, very difficult for new businesses to get all the information they need to start their business, where to get signage, what the signage is, just everything they need. It needs to be a one-stop shop for new businesses coming in. You talk about the, um, the failing infrastructure and the Commission's, I guess, failure to address the problems. So what, what can be done to find more money or to redirect money? What, what in your opinion, isn't being done that needs to be done? Well, that's a long because term. Everybody agrees that right. the infrastructure is a problem. Right. It needs money. And it's a problem all over Where the country. Yeah, it is a problem all over the country because that money, when spent, nobody sees the changes. You don't get that good feeling, oh, we painted the house, doesn't it look beautiful? It's all underground. It's about $300 million that we need, which is just completely overwhelming when you think about it. Had if we had a magic wand and we could go back and increase the money we've put towards it over the years, that would be wonderful, but we don't. So where do you get 300 million? Well, many people right now, I think it seems to be the new buzzword to say we need to get some of the bed tax. You can't get some of the bed tax. The bed tax is very narrowly written. Um, you can try, you know, others have tried, Key West for one, tried to expand the bed tax, but was shot down with, you know, over 30 lobbyists just from Disney World and, and uh, Universal alone. That's, that's a long road to hoe. But you can create almost a parallel tax to that, still taxing tourists at 1% or 2% that the municipality could get. There's also a tremendous 
amount of federal money available. And that's time consuming, trying to find all that. Occasionally the city keys into something like the um, wall, the seawall, but there's so much more out there, especially because we are historic through the historic preservation endowments and things. So I, I personally would look at some volunteers in our city who have knowledge and expertise in grant writing and looking at that kind of funding. Um, you know, doing a municipality tax, again, that would uh, hit the tourists and not the residents. I think the bottom line is it has to come from somewhere. And right now, we need not to be spending money on luxury items. We don't have the luxury of spending money on luxury items. Luxury items being? Like drapes for the, the meeting room. Excuse me. All right, well, that stopped. <laughs> um, for example, in this budget, we have $50,000 going towards new drapes in the conference room. I know how to sew. I'd be happy to sew some drapes, but I don't want $50,000 of my tax money when I've got potholes in the street and I can't drink my tap water. Is it, is it realistic to think in, in whatever form it takes that these fixes can solely come from revenue from tourists? I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't part of it be on residents who are the of stakeholders? Course, of course, 300 million is a lot of money. And we what, need to look at every What form does that take? Is it is it a sales tax? Is it property tax? How, how does that come to be? You know, at this point, I couldn't point to one thing. I know, for example, utility bills have a way to bring in revenue mm -hmm. through Florida Power and Light. There are a number of different ways. Um, and I'm, I'm, at this moment, I'm not knowledgeable of all of those, but I would be open to looking at absolutely everywhere we can squeeze money to get things done. The 300 million, I was just curious about that number. Where, where's that number? Um, that number is about 150 that's been out in, in documents for our pipes and infrastructure, and then about another 150 that they've said for storm uh, water. You guys have any questions? Yeah, I'm curious about the commission and how you serve the individual neighborhoods. Um, how does a commissioner from Davis Shores get to know and serve the people of West Augustine? Can, can you talk about that? Well, sure. We only have 14,000 people. And just like in politics, I go to every single neighborhood, attend meetings, walk the streets. You're involved. You go to things. So you meet people. We're not, we're not that large. Um, West Augustine or West City as, as they now call it, I think quite frankly they haven't had enough attention on them and they're asking for things that they shouldn't have to ask for that should be given. They should be basic necessities and um, they don't right now have a real strong voice unfortunately. Like my neighborhood with this organized neighborhood association we have a voice I don't think you should have to have that, but I think there's a difference in my neighborhood when we ask for something and when West St. Augustine does, and that's not right either. We should all have equal opportunity to be heard. Okay. Do you have anything else? We usually ask if you have, if there's any question that we didn't ask you that you'd like to talk about, or if, if not specifically, if you just want to sort of summarize and wrap up for us, either way. Okay. But if we miss something that you want to talk about. Well, we talked about mobility. We talked about <laughs> <laughs> infrastructure. We talked about code enforcement. Um, I'll tell you, with, with code enforcement is, is big on my list. So there are some other ideas I do have for code enforcement. And I tend to look at other municipalities that are doing things well or right. In this case, I looked at Charlotte, North Carolina, and San Jose, California, for how citizens can report a code violation. Mm -hmm. 
There are phone apps that you can very easily report a, a code violation, like Fix My Hood. There's a phone app, easy phone app, to report a pothole in a road. It sends the G GPS signal directly to the city. There are dedicated phone lines where you can call and um, leave a message. Right now, the only way we have to do it you go online and there's a form and the first thing they ask is who the complainant is and their address. Well, first of all, if you're going to have a system that forces a citizen to report on another citizen, you need to have a way to do it where it's not going to come back to them. It needs to be anonymous. Um, I also don't think that's the way you should be doing it completely. I think there needs to be a dual approach. Um, but those are some, some real easy things. I think we need to make some changes to allow citizens to be heard a lot easier and also have accountability. Right now, just our phone system, when you call planning and zoning, your phone call goes to either a secretary or another person, and they don't even say what their title is. So you don't really even know who you've reached, who's going to get the message, you never hear back, so it's just sort of the big black hole of Calcutta. And then if you keep calling, they get irritated because, by George, they've already heard that three times. Well, I didn't know you heard it because you never told me you even got it. So I think those are just management things that can be done. So um, that's what I hope to do, just bring some, some different ideas to the table, a different way of looking at things and um, do what's right for my fellow residents. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. So you. It's good to meet you.